So the reason why companies should uh, uh, enter the U.S. market is because it is large and it's probably the uh, best way for companies to get shareholder value. Many times companies think that the natural way to expand is to go from their home domestic market and to the neighboring geographical market. We beg to differ, actually. We think that in many cases companies may benefit from going directly to the U.S. market and that in doing so they may achieve great competitive advantages. What many companies experience as being different with the U.S. market is the scale and the complexity of the market. Um, particularly if you come from a smaller market where you're you're used to having direct access to your customers. When you come to the U.S. market, you'll have to deal with channels and partners, and you have to deal with a lot of legal issues, insurance, and so on. And this may be a daunting task for many companies if they don't know how to do it. The difference in distribution from smaller markets to the big U.S. market is that you go from a direct sales form into an indirect sales form. And what that means is that uh, while you've been used to be able to call up people and schedule meetings and then they'll buy your stuff, that is not the case in the U.S. In the U.S. you'll have to deal with middlemen and channels and they again have thousands of other products that they want to sell. So the co whole competitive landscape changes dramatically. So most companies that try to enter the U.S. market fail, and they do that because they fail to understand the realities of this market. Most companies come in and believe very strongly in their product, and maybe often rightly so. It's just that in the U.S. market, product alone is not enough. And as a manufacturer, you're entering into a field where you have to view the whole product set. That means the product, the distribution, the price, how you go to market, who you sell to, and all of those issues. And if you don't put a careful package together that address specific needs of the market, you won't succeed, even if you have the best technology. So, so why is it then that so many companies lose so much money in entering the U.S. market? Well, if you look at what companies do, you can easily see that most of this is spending money on stuff that doesn't work and that can be predicted will not work. An example of this can be building out wrong type of channel and investing lots of money in direct salespeople or programs that won't work because that's not what your clients are looking for. So what you need to do in order to succeed in the U.S. market is to be very diligent about understanding your customer, who the customer is, what he needs, what he's doing today, why he should buy anything from you, what type of problem you solve, and so on. Now, recent studies that we've seen indicate that probably of the, the decisions that CEOs make, probably the, har the hardest one is estimating the size of your market and what the composition of the market is. And so, because it's hard, people do it wrongly and people fail. So the common mistakes that companies make when they try to enter the U.S. market is typically related to their business model. Very often companies assume that the U.S. market is like their home market and then therefore they try to do exactly what they do in their home market. So in other words, if it works in Stockholm, it'll work in Detroit. But it doesn't. So typically when companies come to the U.S., what they experience is that the market is much more complex than they thought it was and also much more expensive. 
And so very often what we see is that people that have been sent from home office to establish a local operation spend six months to a year just trying to figure out how to deal with the market, how to get insurance, how to deal with lawyers, how to get a driver's license, how to sign a lease, and all those types of things instead of doing what they should do, which is selling product. So when should companies think about coming into the U.S. market? Well, there's really no one answer to that, but typically what we, say, what we say is that they should come when their product is as bug-free as to release it to their home market and when there is some, so, some traction in their home market. What they shouldn't do is to introduce products that are not ready. The U.S. market is a very expensive beta test market and if you fail in your first attempt that may be the only shot you have. So what are then the uh, success factors of coming to the US market? Well we think that what companies should do is to behave as a US operation. What US customers want is to interact with companies that offer them the same experience that any US companies would do. So what that means is that you can't really just think of, of the issue as, well, we just need to sell. You need to think of this as giving the customer a whole experience and there's lots involved. The customers typically want to interact the way they've always done and the way they expect from a US company. So behave like a US company would be the short answer to that. So is, is there a way that companies can enter the market without committing huge budgets? Yes, there is. And we think that actually companies should not commit huge budgets until they know what they do. And we suggest that companies spend time to find out in quite a bit of detail who their customers are, what they do today, why they should buy the product, what problem you solve for the customer, and get verification by getting some reference account in the market before you start committing major resources. Now, once you've had reference accounts in the market, you can always build up business models and budgets and so on that make sense because you know who you're going to sell to, what they need, how long it takes to sell, and all those things. Many companies and investors perceive the U.S. market entry of a company as being fraught with a lot of risk. And a lot of companies have lost a lot of money. So then what can you do to, to minimize the risk? Well, we think that one of the things that you should do is to approach it on a step-by-step -step basis. In other words, crawl before you walk, before you run. And so the first thing to do, we think, is to make sure you can start in a geographical area. For example, the Silicon Valley has probably the highest density of technology companies in the world. It's an easy market to test market in and to get some proof of concept and to get reference customers for your product or service. And once you've done that, you can evaluate. Should we go back? Should we start? Should we put money in? Should we reevaluate how we do this? Is the value proposition right? And all those other operational issues that you, you need to address to be successful. And um, in other words, take your time and take it step by step. So when you've decided to enter the U.S. market, um, where should you locate? Should you be on the East Coast? Should you be on the West Coast? Or where should you be? Well, we think that you should be where your customers are and where your channels are. The reason why you want to locate someplace is that you want access to customers and access to markets. And thus should probably be the prime determining factors. The other, f f the other thing that people factor in when they look at location is how close it is to the home market. Well, if you're in Europe, 
people say, oh, if we're on the East Coast, we save three hours. If you look at it from an Asian perspective, people look at the West Coast but that's because that's closer to their geographical proximity. So there's really no short answer to where you should be other than be where your customers are. So then, do you really need to be here? Do you need to have a full setup with office and support team before you start seeding your customers in the U.S.? No, you don't. You can start up here being in a shared office space, for example, but you need to plan. You need to have a plan for what you want to do and how you're going to do it once you get customers. Customer support is a very, very important issue in the U.S. and probably very underestimated by the companies that try to enter. But there are services that you can buy. You can outsource a lot of these functions and, and we would advocate that maybe there's a good reason for outsourcing in at least in the beginning as many of your, of your non-core functions as possible. So is it then important what you know or who you know? I well, both think it's important, obviously, but one of the things that companies tend to forget is that in their home market, they have their network of lawyers and marketing people and salespeople and colleagues and friends, relatives and so on that can help them out. When you come into the U.S. market, you don't, and you have to invent that. And so working with someone that has an established network in the market you're entering is critical and can save you lots of time and cost and aggravation and problems in your market entry. So how should you assess your U.S. market opportunity? <clears throat> well, we think you should be very, very detailed. The U.S. market is huge. It's also very fragmented and very specialized. And what we think that you need to do is to find out where there is a fit for your product or service offering and how you can scale that opportunity. And you need to be focused on one particular market niche or one market vertical from the onset. And we think that the reality is that in order to be successful, if you haven't conquered one market niche, you can forget about conquering the other ones because you will run out of money in the time. So how, how do you assess your U.S. competitors? Well, many companies, when they come here, they get a shock, quite frankly, when they realize that there are huge companies here that they've never heard of, that have established channels, established customers with comparative technology, and they have a full bank account, and they're venture funded. So what do you do? So you th we think that it's very, very important that to do, in order to compete with those types of companies, in order to be a late entrant into a market, you need to be very, very focused, positions you're offering very, very clearly, and be focused on one particular market niche where your product stands out and your combined offering is better than any other competitors. So, so how should you appoint PR agencies or marketing agencies? Well, one, of the, one of the things that we think is very important is to, to get people with track record and references from your particular vertical and your particular industry and that understand the publications, have relationships with the analysts and can do a good job for you. There are many people that will be very happy to take your money. I think what you need to do is to make sure that you know what you're getting for your money and to make sure that the sort of plans and objectives and activities that are outlined address exactly your needs. So should companies hire marketing agencies or PR agencies or any other groups on their own or should they use intermediaries to do that? Well, we think that there's a lot of money to be saved by using intermediaries. 
you tap into a whole network that you haven't got on your own. You can get the contacts, you can get the names, you can get people with track record, and there's a lot of security in that. Plus, it can be done very much faster than you're able to do on your own. So, so why should you be a global player, or, or why should you enter internationally? Isn't it okay to stay at home and know what you have and be content with that? I think there are two main things here. One is one thing called the Internet. And the Internet has facilitated communication on a global scale. And it means that technology is now global. And it also means that product life cycles are much shorter and much more compressed. So you have to take these decisions about what you should do and where you should go and so on at a very much earlier stage than maybe you had to do before. And so, from a technology point of view, it means because of globalization that sooner or later you will be facing companies that have greater resources than yourself because they've been successful in a global market. And because they have greater resources, more money, they will succeed and you won't. So, um, do companies have an opportunistic approach to life or do they have a clear plan? Um, well, unfortunately, most companies are very opportunistic in their approach, in our experience. And so what that means is that um, there's short-term pressure on management to sell product, and therefore it's the temptation to jump on short-term deals. Now, very often this means that you build a business that isn't scalable, and has no clear plan and direction. And sooner or later, you end up with a very diverse customer set, very diverse customer requirements, and so on. And you build a very costly operation. Now, for shareholders, this is less than optimal. And so what we would advocate is that when you make decisions of how you want your com what you want your company to be and how you want to do it, you should map out your plans accordingly. So if, you want, if your objective is to be bought as a company, as an M&A alternative, for example, then you don't build costly distribution structures. You go for a different approach. If your objective is to build out the company and build its brand, well, then obviously there's a different scenario for that. But we find that companies tend to mix those things and build up very costly and very inefficient structures. So in terms of distribution in the US, should you, should you have partnerships? Should you appoint distributors or resellers? Or, or what should you do? Well, it really depends on what your product is and what your market is and how you want to go, how to, how you want to, go to market. There's no right answer for this. Uh, somewhat depends on your resources as well, of course. But what, what, we think it is, what we think you should bear in mind is that appointing a partner won't solve any problem. The partner can't solve your problem. If there is an inherent technology problem with your product, then the part, having a partner in the U.S. won't solve that. And partners, by the way, also have lots of other things to do, typically, and lots of other vendors to deal with. So don't believe that getting a partner in the U.S. will be the end all to everything. So there's, there's of course, lots of risk factors in entering the U.S. market. And a lot of people are scared uh, with good reasons. But so there are success stories, of course, and that there are people who have done it really well. I think one of, um, one of the uh, companies that we looked at that did really well the CEO there said something very wise. He said, the only way that we could approach the U.S. market is by acting as we were a startup, because in effect, we are a startup. So even though you have traction in your home market and customers in your home market, while that is all good and well and ensures that your product is stable and you can use those references and so on, you really have to approach this market from a startup perspective. And I think if you do that, and approach it as you would your own company in your own home market, then there's every reason that you should be successful. 
So then if you want to enter the US market, obviously in all cases you enter a market that's larger than your home market. Now, so does that mean then that it would be natural for management to transition over to the U.S. market, or should you get local management to to act in this uh, to act in this market on your behalf? Well, again, I think there's no clear-cut answer here, but um, I think it depends on what you want with your company. If the issue is that you want to get funding in the U.S. market, then yes, I think management should be here and headquarters should be here. It doesn't necessarily have to be that from day one, but you want to make sure that you have value in here and value then is people and intellectual property and the key resources. And that those are in the US market, I think is logical. Many of the companies that we work with come to the U.S. because they want money from U.S. investors. So uh, when can you get that then? Um, well, typically what U.S. investors want to see, at least in these days, is that A, you understand what your market is and that you've proven that in detail. B, that you know what to do in that market to be successful and that you've proven that by getting some reference accounts and see that you have a management team together that they can that can work together and that have a proven track record and d that you have a technology and a business model that scales and if you have those things yes there's every chance that you can get funding in the u.s market